Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Uh, today we're joined by uh, Ramakrishna Namani, who's come across to us from NASA Ames. Uh, Rama did his uh, BS at uh, Andhra Pradesh Agricultural University in Bapatla, uh, India, uh, and uh, an MS at uh, Punjab Agricultural University uh, in India. And he came across to the US and did a PhD at the University of Montana. Uh, in remote sensing and forestry. Uh, he then did a postdoc at the University of Toronto uh, and uh, went back to uh, Montana as a uh, assistant professor. Uh, he came across to NASA Ames and has been the director of ecological uh, forecasting laboratory uh, since 2003. Uh, his research is uh, interested in uh, tools and techniques for uh, terrestrial ecosystem uh, prediction uh, and he is particularly interested in collaborative computing uh, uh, in Earth science uh, and uh, the NASA Earth Exchange, which he's going to talk to us about today. Um, and uh, so if you'll all join me in welcoming Rama. Uh, Rama. Thank you, Jim. Um, I'm going to talk about a project that we've been involved for the last two years. This project was funded uh, from the ARRA to give this money and really allowed us to expand what we've been thinking for the last 10 years. So, um, but first I want to acknowledge, uh, as, as usual, with these projects, there are a number of people involved um, helping uh, us build this, uh, uh, this, this program. And uh, we have a number of people in my team and around NASA Ames, you know, because it has uh, many dimensions, as, as I will talk about. Uh, there are three things that I want to cover. Um, a little bit of uh, Earth science at NASA, just to give you an idea on uh, what gets done and what are the, the challenges that we face, and then uh, get into more ecological forecasting. This is something of interest to me. Because NASA is mainly interested in geophysical variables, you know, as as, as you would expect from uh, measuring things from uh, from satellites. Um, but what we are interested in infusing the NASA science with biology, you know, trying to actually turn the geophysical observations collected by NASA satellites into more of a biological information. And uh, along the process, we built a, a data modeling system. Uh, that ingests a lot of the, the satellite data and other observations, and then what we learned in, in the process, and then uh, how we ended up with this uh, NASA Earth Exchange. Uh, as you would expect, unlike in physical sciences, where everybody tries to generalize in biology, everybody tries to split things apart. So, you know, people are interested in species, plants, animals, so it's, it's much more diverse in biology. So, it's not as easy to build a facility like NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, where you can bring a bunch of atmospheric scientists and have them build a big model to, to simulate climate. In biology, everybody you know, has their own interest in a little species of plant here, animal there. So, and that's what really drove us to build more of a collaborative, so it's a, a community collaborative rather than a, a single uh, facility. Okay, these are the two broad questions that the Earth Science at NASA follows. How is the global Earth system changing? And uh, what are the magnitudes and trends you know, in, in different variables? And how will it change in the future? And more recently, they also added how can Earth system science improve uh, the mitigation and adaptation to global change? Uh, as, as if, you know, that, that whole topic is settled. Like, you know, we know that the the Earth is changing, and how do we actually uh, try to mitigate what is what is changing, and how can we adapt with the science that we're doing at NASA? Okay, so this is where we started in 1968. This is a picture taken by the Apollo astronauts, and from that time to this, 
and we have made enormous progress you know, in terms of monitoring the Earth. And here we have a constellation of satellites looking at all sorts of uh, features of the Earth in our oceans, the atmosphere, and the land in 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 great detail. You know, from you know this one shot of the Earth. You know, here we have uh, a number of variables looking at the chlorophyll concentration, the clouds, the temperatures. You know, the vegetation, greenness, the land cover. I mean, to to the detail that is uh, unexpected, you know, the 50 years ago that we will be able to map, you know, um, species down to you know, every 30 meters, every acre of land on the planet. So actually, we made phenomenal progress in that sense. Um, but you know, the challenge still remains. And so what we learned over the last 50 years or so is that that you know we the, the population doubled. And actually, we grew the economy almost sevenfold, you know, since about 1950. So, but we also found that that uh, the resources are kind of slowly dwindling. Uh, on the other hand, we also have an incredibly rich information content about our planet, you know, being collected by satellites, aircraft, you know, buoys, you name it. You know, we have tons of information. Um, the challenge is how do you actually take all this information? And, and create something that people can use to make decisions. And, and uh, my favorite thing is, is the Toyota Prius, you know, how you have the, the, the dashboard where you see the gas mileage constantly. And it's, it's really hard to escape, you know, when, you, when you're getting a low mileage and you, know, you want to do something about it. So we're trying to do something very similar, that you package all this information and put it in front of people so that they have only one choice to make. So like, OK, so we are actually uh, seeing these widespread changes. And then you know, they, these are the options. So you, you, they're right in front of you. And that's the challenge that, you know, that we have. And there are some things that you know, we do very well. For example, from satellites, you know, disasters, you know, like you got oil spill, volcanoes. You know, these are um, dramatic changes. So you know that when you see a, a volcano eruption from the satellite, you, know, you want to avoid that area, you know, you want to go around it you know, if you're flying. Um, but those are those are very easy to act upon, that kind of information. But things like, you know, uh, climate change. Uh, we know the CO2 concentration is increasing and, you know, the models predict that there is going to be significant warming, and uh, that results in uh, you know, ice melting, and biological invasions, and all that stuff. But this is a much subtle, much more subtle process. You know, it happens over you know years and decades. So, and it's not as obvious from satellites you know, unless you keep on monitoring it. And this is where we need not only the data but also the models and. And we call that process, you know, like turning this uh, physical information uh, to biological information in our ecological forecasting. The predicting the impacts of chemical, biological, and physical changes you know, on ecosystems in our state and function. So it's, it's really basically you can think of it as, as a global biology. You know, how what's happening to CO2 concentration, what is happening to the temperature, how in turn they translate to changes in, in the biological systems. This is what we're trying to do. And uh, this, is, this is what we built. This, this is quite analogous to weather and climate forecasting. So there you're, you're predicting changes in the physical in the climate, like temperature, water, and wind, and things like that. But here, we're interested in, you know, in uh, crop yields, you know, and the health, you know, the, the muscular populations and, and things like that. Those are much more relevant to the biological systems. So what it does is it, it brings in information from the ground-based sensors, satellites, and airborne sensors. They all come into the central facility in a, in a, in a consistent format. Uh, for example, the satellites, some satellites collect data at, let's say, a 5 kilometer resolution, and then some of them collect at, at uh, 30 meter resolution. So they're all uh, different times, different space scale. And what the system does is actually puts all of them together into a consistent format. 
Okay? And in the same way, you know, we know whether data is collected you know, every minute in some cases, but you may not need that in every minute. Maybe you need it only once a day. Now, what was the maximum temperature? What was the minimum temperature a given day? So the system actually can pre-process the data and give it to you in a way that your models want it. So that's where a lot of the software engineering went, you know, how to manipulate all these raw data coming from different sensors into a form that the, the users or the models need. So if you're a modeler, you know, very interested in, for example, agricultural crop production, and you may want to know, you know how much rainfall has you know, occurred in the last week and, and how sunny or cloudy it was. So you know, you pose the questions and actually the system will return that data to you. you know, whether you use it directly to make a decision or you run a model that would in turn predict the crop yield. You know, it's, it's up to you to structure the, 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 the question. So th this is what we spend a lot of our time in, in, in the past 10 years, is building the software system, really. Now, we haven't really done a lot of science ourselves, and uh, we were more in, in the role of an enabler. You know, we, we worked with a number of uh, people that are interested in water resources and natural hazards like forest fires. Um, but all of them came to us with the request that you know, this is the kind of data I want, this is the format, this is the time scale, this is the space. So, and that's what we provided them. So, and uh, I'll, I'll go into more detail about you know, what people are using with this. But the key elements of the system is it, is allow, it, it allows us to monitor you know, on a regular basis. So we have uh, uh, people using the system to monitor, for example, Yosemite National Park for the last 10 years to see how each month the park changes, you know, how many fires were there, how much area burned, whether the, um, the plants, uh, the snow melted early or late, and things like that. So that's just one example. And it also allows uh, people to do modeling. For example, if you are a farmer in Central Valley and you want to know how much water to you want to give your crop, and it gives you an answer, okay, so, you know, the, the weather has been warm and dry in the last 10 days, so, you, you know, you need to apply this much water to keep your crop healthy. So that's kind of a modeling answer. And, and then the forecasting. Um, so, for example, people may ask, uh, how is the, the coming season looking for snow, snow you know, if we want to um, plan for skiing and all that stuff. Or, you know, in, in, the, in the spring, if you're interested in, in uh, scheduling fire crews and all, where in, in California you want to locate the fire crews, you know, because there is a higher risk in that area. So, things like that. So it's a very broad, you know, uh, applic applications, you know, that you can use the, the system because all it does is bring all the data together and packages in a way that you, that you can uh, use it. And then the other feature is, is the ability to apply the tool at a very fine scale. And you know, we have applied to vineyards at, 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 at you know, every single you know, wine to all the way to global scales, so depending on the question that you're asking. And finally, um, the focus on the biogeochemical cycles. So, like I said, you know, it is quite analogous to uh, weather and climate forecasting. There, you're looking at changes in temperature, water. But here, we're looking at uh, um, chemical cycling. Changes in water, changes in carbon, changes in nitrogen. So those are the three things that we're interested in, in modeling. Uh, for example, you think about carbon. carbon could be used as a, as a crop yield, because ultimately it is photosynthesis that is turned into crop yield. And the uh, same way carbon turned into biomass, you know, that you know, trees grow. So, so you can express the changes in these three elements in a, in a, in a very number of different ways. So, but it allows us to focus on just doing you know, as good a job as we can on, on just those three. Okay, so this is where we start. Uh, typically, when we apply you know, the, the modeling system over like California, and we go and look at, okay, how many weather stations are there? You know, uh, who is collecting data on weather? And you won't believe how many people actually have weather stations. Many, many people run weather stations, but not, not everybody, including the government agencies, actually share the data among themselves. So you have, uh, the, the NOAA guys, they run their own network, and then uh, you have a California uh, 
lot of resources they run their networks but they rarely they share the data you know, among these agencies and actually we are the only ones we bring all the data into one single system and actually grid these station data into spatially continuous surfaces so that a uh, farmer you know that is in central valley you know he may have a station you know, 50 miles away but this system allows us uh, allows them to access what could be the, the weather around you know, their farm. So it's, it's a first approximation of actually taking the satellite data, taking the weather data to provide spatially continuous surfaces. Okay, in the same way, we also bring in satellite data um, every eight days, you know, looking at changes in snow cover, you know, uh, fire occurrences and things like that. So uh, you can deploy the system, for example, over landscapes of California, you will have this kind of information provided to you every eight days. And, and then we put all this information together um, with models to, to map these, uh, produce these now casts and forecasts of how the ecosystems are actually functioning uh, all over California. And uh, what is the weather like? You know, what are the hydrologic conditions? And how good the, uh, how, how is the vegetation in terms of its growth, whether it is uh, growing uh, less than normal or better than normal and every week that we can produce these things. And in the same way, we can also um, produce an estimate of how much carbon has been accumulated by the vegetation over landscapes in California. So, so this, all this happens every single day uh, in an automated way. And, and, uh, and, and, and finally, all the results are presented in, in this kind of a dashboard style um, uh, interface where you can, so this is the Yosemite National Park here, so people can uh, um, draw um, a area around Yosemite Park and then you can know, pull up um, things like uh, start of the growing season, you know, when did the uh, tree start growing in the Yosemite National Park and uh, look at the changes from year to year, whether, you know, one year, you know, it starts earlier than others. So it gives you in, in one you know, screen all the information about you know, the park, um, how it, it is behaving at a given time. And uh, like that, we have had a number of applications that we have done. Um, we worked with teams that looked at the biodiversity in, in national parks. And we worked with uh, people that looked at West Nile virus and influenza. <coughs> Um, because they're all kind of tied to climate, you know, climate variability. So uh, anything that is related to climate, we can actually bring some kind of signal into it from our system. And uh, we also work with the, with the NOAA people on stream temperatures and how they affect the, the fish mortality. Um, and then uh, we work with the insurance companies looking at the, the, the crop uh, damages in different areas due to hail and, and floods and, and, and uh, droughts and coral reefs. So uh, a number of different applications that we've done over the past eight years. What we learned in the process uh, is, is this, that majority of the time scientists spend in actually dealing with the data. So we think they spend as much as 80% of their time dealing with the data. It's just kind of a hard to believe, actually, that you know, we end up spending so much time on dealing with the data. Because usually the, the, the data nowadays tend to be large, and they're in different formats. You know, and they're in different places. First, you had to put in the request, and then you had to wait until they say, OK, you, know, you have your file available. You go get it, and then you manipulate it. And think about it. Thousands of people are doing exactly the same thing. Okay, all, so, and uh, that's what we learned. Even with the people that we worked in over the last 10 years, they were all doing the same thing. They were all, they were getting, and you know, we were getting the data from NASA satellites, and then we are blending it with other data, and then we're producing the model, and then they're getting the data from us. So this just, everybody is actually, you know, moving the data around, you know, instead of actually looking at the data, analyzing it, you know, using it. So, so much time is actually spent on that. And we're hoping actually to reverse that. So from in the spending 80%, you know, we want to bring it down to only 20% so that you have a lot more time to actually do the analysis 
And we want to do that by uh, moving the code to the data. Yeah, because we also found out that even though we had only about, I would say, 25, 30 partners in the last you know, 10 years, just the amount of data that we started creating it was terabytes and terabytes of data that we're creating. And then they're moving all these data from us. So, uh, and we finally we come, came to the point that it is just not possible to move all these data you know, over the internet. And, uh, and and the third thing is this, you know, we, we, in the past, we used to do this, you know, one scientist, one project, you know, so that you get a grant and then you work on it and you publish a paper, you move on to this. But now, it's really, you know, we just don't have all the skills that we need to do the, the science that we, that we wanted to. For example, you know, I, there is no way I can run the top system by myself. Just because uh, the, we need people in software engineering, we need people in data data management, you know. So there are many, many people that you need. So there is no other way except to collaborate with the, with, the, with the number of people that we can do this. And uh, and then this one is is in my own experience. You know, I I was a grad student and I had a number of grad students myself. We, we tend to write the same kind of code over and over, over and over. You know, think about it. You know, you, so you have a NASA mission that collects data and then they put it uh, at a data center and then people go get it and they're doing exactly the same routine a million times. You know, how to, okay? And I think we need to change that. We need to, uh, we need to be able to reuse and share the code. You know, so, if we can actually develop a set of tools right up front with the mission and then share all the tools, you'll cut in a lot of these kind of waste. You know. And uh, finally, creating efficiencies and transparency and, re and repeatability. And um, many of you can relate to this. A lot of times, you know, we do the analysis, we, do, we publish, and then we move on. Rarely, you know, we go back and. Uh, and especially when you have grad students, they come and do the work and then they publish and they move on. And it's nearly impossible to find what they've done actually. So the next grad student comes and they start all over again. Okay, so that we need to figure out, we need to capture these workflows somehow. And I, I don't know how yet, but we're trying. We're trying to capture some of the process you know, that uh, people go through so that the next generation benefits. So those are the lesson that, lessons that we learn ourselves, actually, you know, and then we learn from others, you know, that we work with. But somehow we got to address, you know, some of these issues to to benefit the community as a whole because we have more and more missions. The missions are complex, you know, they're collecting, you know, much bigger data sets than they used to do in the past. And, uh, and NASA has this policy of actually collecting the data and um, the PI, you know, processes the data and then sends it to a data center. And the data centers are distributed all over the country. So if you want uh, land data, and uh, you go to Eros Data Center in Sioux Falls. And if you want oceans data, you go to JPL. If you want atmospheric data, you go to Goddard. And so they're, they're distributed all, all over the place. And, and, uh, and try doing uh, some kind of an interdisciplinary science you know, a project where you need to get you know, data for oceans, land, and atmosphere. I mean, it will take you a year to get all these things together. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the time you know, we, we came across uh, the fourth paradigm. You know, Jim, James Gray, probably some of you know, and he had a lot of interesting ideas about uh, uh, data intensive science. And then he firmly believed uh, that we really have to change the way we do science in this in a new era of uh, large data sets. Uh, he was talking about uh, genomic uh, and other data sets and, and space. A telescope and all that stuff, but we actually learned a lot from his and you know, a book on you know, what he proposed, and we implemented. And you know, right around the time, you know, the economy, you know, had a lot of trouble, and the NASA asked us to say, "Okay, do you guys have any ideas that where we can spend some stimulus money?" 
and we said, okay, so let's try this, you know, as, a, as an experiment. And that's what we did. So we, we proposed this idea of creating the Earth, Earth Exchange, you know, like a, a collaborative platform which encourages people to explore and, and collaborate. And, you know, it's basically we're trying to uh, accomplish what NASA always wanted, but in a, in a single platform. Okay, so this is the architecture of the system that we have. So it has uh, many components. Uh, it starts with the supercomputing that you know, as a, because we had to have something to build upon. You know, there is no way we could build the entire NEX you know, from you know, ground zero. So we 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 use the the supercomputing that that we have uh, at Ames, and we added. Uh, this uh, massive storage system. You know, it, I think right now we're about three petabytes um, of storage that, that that we added to the system, and then and then we we built a, a more like a social networking portal on on top, so where people can come together and uh, kind of uh, exchange ideas and and and, uh, and collaborate there. And once they have uh, agree upon an idea, let's say, okay, you know, as a team, you come together and say, well, we should really try this particular algorithm you know, on this new data set that we have. And that's where we have this uh, little sandbox that allows you to test ideas. You know, it doesn't have a lot of computing. It has about 98 cores, um, but it allows you to test the ideas here. And then, if you're satisfied and that the community likes what they what they see from that experiment, then we can we can deploy these in these large scale resources. Then we can we can scale the ideas all the way to global scale. So that's the idea. So you kind of come together, and then you know test you know talk about ideas and then implement them on this in a small in a sandbox. And if everybody likes it, then go and and do it and then bring the results back. To the sandbox where the community can interact, and as you can see, there are different levels of access. Obviously, you know we are behind the firewalls at NASA, and the way you know we have so far were able to convince the NASA and lawyers and other people is that that uh, people can come to the system and then interact with the portal without a lot of trouble. So there is not not a whole lot of paperwork here, but using the cloud computing. And there is a bit of paperwork, and you know, we still have to put in uh, some requests, and then somebody has to approve. And then, you know, getting access to the to the to the supercomputing and takes you know multiple weeks. But you know, this is the this is what I tell the community. You know, we still have to go through this painful process because you have a beautiful resource available at the end. So that's the, really the 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 carrot that they have. Um, It's kind of a new because in uh, for the last ten years, NASA's model is uh, uh, data centers. So you have missions, and you have PIs, and you have data centers. So you you launch a mission, and then the PI is in charge of you know, creating some products, and then they go to the data centers, and that's it. But this is is more like a. Um, like a knowledge creation a collaborative. So you, you basically you work on, with the data that, that the missions collected uh, in a collaborative. So it's, it's a completely different paradigm for them to, uh, to transition from the simple data, uh, data centers to more of our collaboratives. And when we have a number of collaborative tools, and I, I, as many of you know, NASA Ames is actually uh, quite progressive in the sense that you know they have started on these collaboratives in a long time ago. I look at the Nas uh, Astrobiology Institute and the Lunar Science Institute. I think they pioneered a lot of these uh, tools, and we're really just kind of piggybacking on what they have built, you know, like websites, and we have our. Uh, uh, teleconferencing, you know, workflow generation, online workflow generation, visualization. So basically, we're taking a lot of those tools that they have developed. Um, so typically, what uh, happens is people register on the site, and uh, and then the request, okay, I want access to this particular you know, data set and these tools and the models, and then I need uh, 20 terabytes of space, and I want 100,000 CPU hours for six months, that's it. So that's the request. And then that's what the system you know, creates, a temporary environment. And then, 
uh, and then you know you can bring your models or whatever you know so once you once you have the space you know then you can do whatever you want with within those resource constraints when uh, when you finish the work and all the the resources are recycled to other you know users and and we're trying to figure out how to capture the knowledge with the consent of uh, the, the people that, that worked on the system. Obviously, this is kind of a sociology issue. You know, we don't know Anna, how much to intrude into their into their work. And it, we don't want it to be free that they come and use this thing and then go away because then you're not really helping anyone. And, but at the same time, you don't want to be a big brother and then he's looking at what they're doing and then trying to capture that. So, they, you know, we're kind of walking a fine line right now um, on that. And, uh, uh, but the, the knowledge management system is something that uh, a lot of people are willing to actually to cooperate, uh, like sharing their papers, presentations, and, and all sorts of things like that. So that part, uh, we're not too worried about, um, you know, having the community engaged, but it is uh, mainly in when, when somebody's working on a new idea and, and how much, you know, you want to be involved in that process. Okay, so, and uh, this is a uh, part of the, the, um, the work that we're trying to do. This, which trails is a, is a NSF funded workflow management system so that you can actually uh, design a workflow and then execute it and then see how well you know, the results, you know, conform to what you expected. And then if you're not satisfied, you go back and refine. So it, it's like an iterative process. And as a team, actually, you can, you can, uh, online, come and come together and change things around, execute them. So it's, it's a more of an, a, an interactive collaboration that you can capture. Once you're satisfied with what you see, and then you can actually capture that workflow and, and put it in the library, okay? This particular workflow produced the results that were published in this paper. So that's really where we're trying to go. Uh, so you'll have an archive of not only the paper, but also the workflow that went with it. Uh, okay, these are, uh, I don't want to go into detail on this. Um, so some, because we chose these trails because it has a lot of uh, advantages, mainly uh, Python. You know, I think a lot of my guys, you know, they like Python, so they think it's quite easy to integrate with everything else um, that we have on the system. And we're also uh, using uh, IRODs uh, as our data management system. One thing that I found out, you know, to my own surprise, is that when you bring in data from these missions, you know, you create thousands and thousands and thousands of files. I mean, you know, yeah. so for example, we work with the MODIS, one of the sensors on Earth observing system, and the the way they produce these data sets is each day, you know, you, you create like 320 files per one variable. And we have something like 24 variables. So that's one day. <laughs> so you can imagine, you know, over, over a year, how many, you know, hundreds and hundreds of files. And, and I think this system kind of allows us to um, actually organize all the data. And imagine you have all these files coming in, and then you have users taking all these files and creating and you know, multiplying by, you know, two or three times. So it's, it's it's actually quite fascinating, you know, when you look at all these people and how many thousands of files they're creating every day. Okay, so what are people doing, you know, with the, what we have right now? Um, so this is one example where a team of scientists from around the country came together and they all, you know, have their own models trying to to look at the carbon cycling, you know, how the carbon cycles through the, the through the landscape. and. Uh, and uh, so typically what happens is in these uh, modeling experiments, you know, somebody uh, volunteers to create all the driving variables, okay, you know, for all the models. And, uh, and, then, and then everybody gets those driving variables and then runs their model and then submit the, submit the results to, to a central facility. And then somebody else comes in, takes all the models, and then, you know, analyzes into a common format and all that stuff. But on NEX, all people have to do is bring their codes to NEX. Everything is there. All the input data sets are there and all the analysis tools are there. So they just have to bring in their code and then run you know, their model and then say, hey, you know, my outputs are in this directory and that's it. 
So, so there is no more movement of the data. So everything is there. So that's that's one example. And the second example. One quick question. Yeah. You were using the present tense there. Yeah. Does that exist now, yes. or is that in your plan? The, no, that's that's that exists. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. That's one of the examples that people are doing. Yeah. And, and this is another example. And we have uh, a paper uh, last year looking at uh, warming due to CO2 fertilization. For, you know, there are two ways you know, the, the climate is warming. One is, is the radiative forcing, purely from radiative forcing of the CO2. The other one is when you, when you increase the CO2 concentration, the plants, you know, they don't open their stomates you know, as much as the otherwise, so they don't, they don't transpire as much water, okay? If they don't transpire as much water, that they, they actually release more, you know, in terms, in heat, rather than in transpiration. So, that excess heat could be as much as, you know, uh, could result in, in, in extra warming, additional warming, okay? So, a lot of people think that if you don't include this effect in the climate models, you would underpredict the warming, okay? But, the advantage we have with the NEX is now we have the entire workflow on the system. So we can not only repeat that, you know, the results that we have with the newer versions of the model, but if somebody has a better idea about how to actually conduct that particular experiment, they can recall the workflow, change things around, and then redo the experiment. Okay, so the other example is now we have 30 years of uh, uh, satellite data. Um, that have been consistently processed. This is probably one of the best data sets that we have looking for looking at the planet as a whole and how it has changed over the last 30 years. And uh, believe me, you know, once we have this av data available, there will be hundreds of hundreds of you know, scientists from all over the world looking at uh, what's happening in, uh, in the Arctic, what's happening in the Sahel, what's happening in India. Because everybody is interested in their own, you know, very few people are interested in the planet as a whole, but many, many people are interested in their own regions and all that stuff. And we're trying to facilitate uh, a standard set of tools that everybody can follow. So we have the data on NEX. If you're interested in looking at Sahel, and I can guarantee you that the same guy or a team that did the, the, the Arctic, we can apply the same software to do the Sahel also. So very quickly that we can, we can facilitate this kind of uh, uh, analysis. Okay, so uh, another example, we're also working with a team at the University of Maryland and that they have, uh, They've been looking at how the, the U.S. forest cover has changed over the last 30 years. And, but in the past, they weren't able to do wall-to-wall -wall analysis. They were doing a few samples, you know, that they carefully chose because they didn't have the power or the data available. Okay? But now, with the NEX, you know, they're, they're doing entire wall-to-wall. -wall. So from 1984, you know, they're going to see how the continental U.S. has changed over the last you know, 30 or so years. And that takes some serious processing, and not only processing, but also the data storage. But th that, that's the kind of a research that we want to, to promote. Okay, um, similarly, you know, this is a, a mosaic of a Landsat. Uh, this is probably our, one of our oldest satellites, first launched in 1972. And uh, nobody has ever put together global mosaics like this at 30 meter resolution. It has never been done before. It, it is possible now for two reasons. Number one, we have the bandwidth to actually bring all the data from all over the world into one place, okay? So without the internet, probably we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do that. But the second is, is, is something like NEX so that allows you to process, you know, we, we process something like 75,000 75, scenes to create these, uh, these annual, you know, monthly mosaics. Okay. So now, you know, we can, we can look at, uh, for example, Central Valley, California. We can see how it, it changed, you know, over the last year, I mean, every month, uh, how the crops, you know, have performed. So, this data set gives us the level of detail that was never possible in the past. 
just to give you an idea. So here is a, is a Nampa Valley in our, our vineyard. See how we can track, you know, see individual, you know, blocks in our, in the vineyard and how we can track over time. See? And, but we can also actually advise them, uh, um, about how much water they need to put you know, on their vineyards so that they perform you know, their best. You know. Okay, so let's say you know a lot of these winters they they want to uh, give more water early in the season, but once the fruit sets, you know they want to actually hold the water back so that uh, the plants put more sugars into the into the fruit. So, but anyway, so they have these uh, different metrics that they want to uh, attain. And, and the system allows them, okay. So given the weather, given the, the canopy condition, this is how much water you need to, to put on, on, on the canopy. And then we're also building, uh, uh, this mobile interface, uh, where, you know, you can drive around your vineyard, you can go to a particular spot, and then actually you can say, okay, and I want to know exactly what, and I need to do for this particular block. And then that sends a signal to the server and then it returns a value on, you know, what you need to do. So, but this, the, the, the advantage of a, uh, an application like this is once you put a global data set together with an application like this, you can take it to Italy, you can take it to Spain, wherever it is, because we have the data set to support, you know, the application. Okay, another example is uh, that we have, you know, we have satellite missions, you know, that collected fantastic data sets, like in Landsat, for example, just I was talking to you, at 30 meter resolution, we have this data, and we have this LIDAR, uh, mainly launched to look at the, the ice, you know, sheet, you know, but we, we also use that to, to look at the canopy height. And then we have the SRT, the shuttle radar that uh, the NASA flew that penetrates the canopy to look at the, the ground and a height. But nobody has ever put all these data sets together into a three-dimensional structure of the canopy. See, because we never had the storage or the computing power to do it. For the first time, we can bring the data from all these missions into, into you know, characterizing the, the, the canopy conditions, you know. At, at every 30 meter resolution. So we can create, uh, for example, a, a biomass map, a standing biomass map of, of the planet at for every acre of the land. Okay, so the last one that I want to talk about is, uh, you know, we, we briefly talked about the, the workflows, how you need to capture the workflow so that the, the next generation benefits from that. So let me give you an example of how useful they are. So the Amazon you know, forest had experienced two droughts in a, in a span of 10 years. I mean, this is really unreal, and I don't think it happened in, in, the, in the historical record that there were two droughts in a span of 10 years. So the first one was in 2005, and everybody thought it was a drought of the century. I mean, it was just unreal what they observed. And uh, for us, you know, it was, it fell during the time when we had the be some of the best data. You know, EOS was launched in, two, you know, 1999, and you know, we had like, you know, six or seven different sensors collecting all sorts of data. And, uh, and, and for the 2005 drought, we methodically, you know, got the data from uh, rainfall from Goddard, you know, and then vegetation data from Sioux Falls in South Dakota. And we, you know, we created, carefully analyzed all the data sets. And then we finally published in 2010. Okay. So just when we published the paper and the 2010 drought started, and you can see, you know, we had access to this, uh, uh, Manaus you know, river stage, you know, that comes into our database and, and that really showed right around October that is going to be the record, you know, that, you know, it actually beat the 2005. But now we have everything in place and you know, we have uh, all the data sets are coming in. We have a workflow and we were able to actually do the analysis and write the paper. And the whole thing was done and you know, by January 15th. So from, 
Now, from end of October to January 15, we were able to analyze and actually send a manuscript. So, but it was finally published in, in March. But that's the kind of efficiency that we're talking about. So, by by creating a, uh, um, a workflow that is available on the system, people can access it and use it and quickly, you know, um, do research. You know, this is what we're trying to accommodate. Okay, so uh, what we would like to accomplish is, is this. We want to lower the barrier. A lot of people, and I come from university, and I, I was a, a student and a faculty at the University of Montana, and you talk to these kids about using NASA data, and they they don't know where to start, actually, you know, with this, you know, where do we, how do we go, Download the data from Eros Data Center. You know what do we do with it? Because for a lot of these uh, young students, the the data sets are pretty complex. Actually, they they're not. You know, once you get used to these data sets, they, they may not be intimidating. But for a for a young you know, a student, they are quite intimidating. And we're hoping by bringing these students onto something like NEX, which also has experienced researchers. You know working on the system, that they can talk to each other, they can share you know, their programs, their, their, their software on the system. So that is not as intimidating an experience as it otherwise would be, you know, if you're sitting at your own computer in some small university. And um, the second one is, is, is the interaction between research applications and technology. Uh, NASA funds these, these things separately. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm mainly I have funded you know, from the from the research program, but there is a whole different uh, program that funds the uh, technology development, and there is a completely different uh, applications in you know, a program. But we're trying to actually bring all of them together into one place, so that you know if I'm doing an application and I have a requirement, and I can go talk to the people who are doing technology right on the system. Okay, so they, it's a we're, we're trying to accelerate the, the process. And then, and as I talked about, the workflows is a, is an important you know, thing because, uh, so one of the things that we're, we're doing now is uh, playing a key role in the national climate assessment. So the Congress mandated US agencies that they need to produce an assessment of the climate and climate impacts every four years and what happened in the US. And as you know, there is a quite a bit of controversy about uh, climate analysis and how robust they are. You know, they're not transparent. And that, uh, so they, you know, you probably heard about the climate gate. And, but we're trying to actually create a process where people would have, you know, a workflow. For example, somebody published a paper, and you will have a workflow that is associated with it. That you know, somebody wants to check the results, they can actually come and reproduce the results. So, they, so which is this is going to be a key uh, ingredient in the in the climate assessment, and then the other one is this interdisciplinary. And I've been with the the EOS program for almost fifteen years. And when we started out, and uh, the, our hope was that somehow we will be able to have the ocean scientists, the atmosphere scientists, and the land scientists all work together and for the greater good. And believe me, when I go to a meeting and the ocean guys are sitting there, the atmosphere guys are sitting there, and the land guys are sitting there. But really, I mean, because they just don't have, they don't really see very much in common because they have their own stove piped, you know, uh, things. We're trying to actually bring them together onto one platform. You know, it's not going to happen overnight, but at least if they start working on one platform, that they'll see that there are many, many commonalities in dealing with the data. The last thing is, is challenging the community. I remember uh, when I was a grad student, we had only one sensor you know, that was collecting, which is AVHRR, which is a NOVA satellite designed mainly to look at clouds. And we were complaining bitterly that, you know, what is NASA doing? And then NASA launches EOS, okay? I mean, it's a massive mission with uh, six or seven different sensors on board. And then two years later, they launched the, the, the Aqua. And so all of a sudden, we're just drowning in data. And 
and we say, okay, what is it? What great things can we do with all this data? Okay, because we are trained to actually work on small areas because of the limitations that when, so when you were getting training, you know, you, you're limited by, you know, what you could do. Okay, all of a sudden you're actually presented with all these, you know, sensors and data from all these sensors and, you know, you have to think bigger. You know, you just have to, you know, sit back and say, hey, you know, what am I going to do now, you know, with all these data, all this computing? So the same thinking that we grew up with is not necessarily suitable to what we have right now. Thank you. Rama, can I kick off the questions? You, you didn't mention it, but do you have any projects that are looking at uh, Antarctica or the Arctic? I'm Arctic, sure you do. Arctic, Arctic yeah. we're looking at, yeah. Right. Yeah, we're looking at Arctic amplification, and because in general, the Arctic is warming at about three or four times you know, uh, greater than the, the rest of the planet. And along with that, the Arctic vegetation is changing dramatically. Uh, so that, and we're looking at the, the, the changes in uh, not only productivity of the plants, but also the community composition. And we see more and more woody species moving you know, closer to the, to the Arctic than, than ever before. So that's, uh, but it has a lot of feedbacks. So once you uh, darken the, the surface, you know, from a snow covered landscapes to more of a uh, darker uh, conifer covered plants, and that changes the energy balance of, of the planet. Okay, so, uh, but you know, we're not, you know, we're not climate scientists, but we're looking at how the Arctic itself is changing and uh, how it will f feed back into the, into the climate. Yeah, question. I know uh, the Goddard Institute for Space Science has had a global circulation model yes. for like 25 years. Yes. Um, do you work with them? Do they work with you? How do you take advantage of their... Like I think they're like Model E version. Yes. Or something. Yeah. We have Model E and uh, running on our system. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. What kind of tools are available for either model-based or statistically based uh, prediction of, for example, how much it's going to rain next year in a particular location of of interest? Not, not weather forecasting, which is five or ten days, not climate, which is a hundred years, but that kind of middle distance that's yeah. probably of great interest to agriculture and public policy. Yeah, and, and the, the Goddard uh, group has a, has a model that they run, um, the Goddard Modeling and Assimilation Office, GMAO. So they, they have a model called GIOS, um, GIOS 5 is, is the latest version. They run their model up to about six months, you know, into the future. But the, 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 the results have been kind of mixed with the seasonal forecast. Um, I don't think, you know, unless we are in a, in a strong El Nino year or a La Nina year, and the rest of the time, I don't think there is a whole lot of uh, signal. Yeah. But, you know, who knows? It may, maybe it will change in the next 10 years. But so far, the, I think that's the general consensus. Yeah. Uh, the there, uh, NASA's got a PDS, uh, Planetary Data System, yeah. well, I was going to say website. It's actually a set of websites, and some of the community issues are the same as what you're talking about. There's a rings node, there's an atmospheres node, and all different communities, and people in my group at Ames are helping them try to unify all of that. So my question is, how general is your approach here? Is, how conceivable is it that somebody, not necessarily you, could take all of this and duplicate it and then tweak it or maybe overhaul it to suit a very different domain. Some of their problems, the way they approach things, aren't exactly the same. They're not all focused on one body, uh, for example. Or is this so customized that it would really just be the ideas behind it that someone would have to take and try to use it somewhere else? I, I don't think it is really that customized to earth sciences. If you think about underlying technologies, and um, for example, IRARDS, you know, it, it came from the NSF, from the geosciences community, and we're trying, you know, we're, we're tweaking that to suit our needs, but I can easily imagine that it is used in planetary sciences. Yeah, so I don't think it's an issue there. Uh, same thing with the workflows, the beast trails. Um, now I went and met with the NSF folks. They told me that they, they fund 120 teams. 
in a developing workflows. And, and they asked me why we chose VStrails. And I told them that, you know, we get along with the PI. So I, I think in the end, is a lot is about, you know, sociology, you know, uh, yeah. So do you allow uh, scientists to add data that they might be working on that to your system? For example, I could see someone wanting to coordinate global climate with solar cycles, and they might want to have a whole set of solar data that's not in your database. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I think we haven't completely thought through about this data thing, uh, to be honest. Um, in the beginning, I was kind of nonchalant about data. You know, I thought, well, you know, we have plenty of space, three petabytes, you know. But very quickly, I'm learning that uh, that once you let scientists lose on, you know, they'll, they'll fill it up very quickly. Uh, <laughs> but so uh, we are working on these uh, governing policies, like uh, how long would you have this resource available? Let's say you produce some great data set and a good paper and does it mean you know we 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 actually archive your data and make it available you know to to the rest of the community? You know who decides that? And, and I have no idea yet. You know, we, <laughs> yeah, I think we're, go we're we're going to be there very quickly about you know uh, some of these policy issues that. And as a scientist, I'm kind of clueless to be honest. Yeah. You mentioned uh, a cost drama. A can you tell us what sort of costs are involved for the for a user or scientist? Um, it's absolutely free. free. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So there are two ways of uh, access. Um, uh, one, if anybody who is funded through Roses um, is, is is given pretty much uh, an automatic access. And uh, the other option that we're trying is uh, we will have an open call uh, four times a year. So you put in like a one pager. Okay, so uh, a one pager will be evaluated by you know three or four people, and then they either encourage you or discourage you. If you get encouraged, and then you are asked to do a three page proposal. Okay, and then once you have a, a, a three page approved, uh, you'll get access to the system and for however many months you requested with the with you know the space and then the CP hours. Yeah. Um. Uh, are you familiar with ESMF, the Earth System Modeling yes. Framework, yes. and how yes. does this then differentiate from that infrastructure encoding um, support? And uh, it's very modular, and you can plug and swap things in and yeah. out. How does this differentiate from ESMF, which is a multi-agency enterprise, both uh, NOAA, uh, yeah, but NASA, ESMF et cetera? to me, is more like how you put the pieces together. Let's say you have something like uh, a climate model. And uh, uh, within the climate model, you know, people have different versions of uh, land surface and ice and things like that. I think ESMF is a great tool to actually put the pieces together, you know, without having to understand everything, you know, about the model. But what we're doing here is more of a, a platform. Okay, so we can actually have ESMF running on the system, and and we have let's say. We have a dozen different ecosystem models on the, on this thing. And they have a slightly different, uh, let's say, uh, soil hydrology. But if you have ESMF running on the system, they should be able to plug you know, a soil hydrology model from whoever they want into their, into their model. So that's where the ESMF really comes into play. Yeah. Okay. There's no further questions. Uh, if you'll all join me in thanking Rao for his great talk. Thank you.